Thank you. Well, I'm not used to being introduced in such a uh, formal, flattering way. So education in Vermont has been uh, a priority for me for a very long time. Um, uh, and uh, raising children in Vermont um, and teaching in Vermont has, and then now on the House Education Committee, I've seen the education system from different perspectives. Uh, and I want to go into uh, where we are now and where we might go in the future. I put up, just for starters, uh, this is sort of a mosaic of um, Vermont. The uh, different uh, colors represent different supervisory unions. The different uh, striping patterns represent different uh, opportunities for choice in various school districts across the state. Uh, the solid colors are the ones that operate school districts. So we in Addison County are um, pretty straightforward. All the towns in Addison County operate their own schools, either their elementary school in their own community or a, and are members of Union High Schools, three of them, uh, uh, Virgins, Bristol, and uh, here in Middlebury. Um, so I have, hmm, I did have, there it is, uh, PowerPoint, um, oops. Uh, so point of Act 46, the moment, uh, our Vermont Constitution of years we delegated that responsibility to local school districts that it's in fact the state's responsibility for the education of the children of the state and that we need to do it in a way that's equitable uh, that was in the Supreme Court decision and that we've always uh, strived for quality at a price that taxpayers can afford so the goals of Act 46 are quality, equity, and sustainability. There's three sort of sections of this presentation, sort of the, the big picture of the state's view of, or the, the realities that we face in the legislature of the fiscal situation around school spending. Then a review of how taxes are assessed throughout the state. And then finally, Act 46 and where we go from here in the future. So this is a common theme that I've heard uh, knocking on doors. Um, my taxes are too high. We need to spend money on things. We need to have an education. We need a safety net. We need to clean up our state waters. We need to have a good correction system and so forth. Um, and to do that, we have to pay for it. But don't tax me. Uh, tax someone else. Here's our education fund. And you can see the largest piece is the non-residential, non-homestead education tax. That tax rate is set at the legislature. It applies to every parcel of non-residential property in the state. The same tax rate. And raises uh, over $600 million. The larger section uh, of the pie is the homestead rate. And the base homestead rate, the floor, is set at the state. This year it's 99 cents. And that's ratcheted up depending on what the uh, local voters decide to spend in their local community over the base calculation amount. The third largest piece is a transfer from the general fund. That's mostly income and sales tax. And we have an additional 35% of the sales tax uh, that accounts for $135 million that's put into the education fund. There are a few small pieces, a third of the purchase tax that you, uh, that you remit when you purchase a vehicle. All of the lottery profits, some small Medicaid money and other sources. So this is a spreadsheet. I didn't put it up here for you to see the numbers because they're tiny. 
um, but an idea of what we see each year in terms of the income and the outflow from the education fund. We have to balance this uh, <clears throat> at the end of each session. So here's the basis of the problem. The red line represents the decline in students, student population that we've had over the last decade. It's been quite steep. And if you go back before 2005, this, this steep decline in student population actually started around 1999. The, blue, the green bars represent our increases in education spending. So despite the fact that we've had a relatively steep decline in students, roughly a 20% decline in students, we've significantly increased education spending. In fact, uh, the spending now out of the education fund for K through 12 education is around $1.3 billion that we use to educate 88,000 students. At the same time that we've lost, precipit precipitously lost students, our staffing level in the schools, both teachers, paid uh, uh, certified teachers and paraprofessionals has re remained relatively st steady throughout the time. And that has led to a current staff to st student ratio of one staff member for every 4.67 students. And to give you an idea of the scope of this thing, if we were to increase that ratio to one to five students, we would save $74 million or seven cents on your property tax rate. In addition to the demographic student population decline that we've seen, we are going through now and will continue to go through in the next couple of decades a relatively uh, steep uh, decline in the number of uh, working citizens under age 65. This is the baby boomer generation here and here it is moving through the decades. Uh, by 1930, um, the bulk of the baby boom population, by 2030, the bulk of the baby boom population will be living on fixed incomes. And their capacity to pay taxes will be significantly less than it is now. So here's money going into the education fund, the non-residential property tax that I spoke of some other state revenues, income and, and uh, sales tax, and the residential property tax base rate that, this, that the legislature sets, it's currently at 99 cents, and you put all that money into the education fund, and it yields just under $10,000 per pupil. So uh, if a school were to spend, a school district were to spend $10,000 per pupil, there would be no increase in the local property tax rate. It would be 99 cents for a homestead property tax rate. That's not the case. Our average spending around the state is just under $15,000 per pupil. So what does that mean? At $15,000 per pupil, the non-residential rate still is fixed by the legislature. These revenues don't change. And so the increase uh, in spending per pupil has to be absorbed at the, by the local residents. And that boosts the base property, 99 cent base property tax rate up to $1.57. One of the questions I get a lot is, my, our school budget only went up one, less than 1%, how the heck did my tax bill go up 10%? And this is a uh, example of how that has happened across the state. So in this example community, their spending in, in fiscal year 14 was 27 million 600,000 or 700,000. In FY15, it's 27 million 800,000, which is a six tenths of a percent increase in their education spending. But what the headlines didn't tell you was that that school, uh, that community lost 50 students. So since we calculate taxes based on a per pupil basis, if you spend the same amount on fewer students, you have a higher per pupil cost. In addition, this community lost some federal money 
Maybe they lost some Title I money or special ed money uh, or some other local funding source. So now this, that 0.6% increase is now up to 7.5% because the per pupil cost has gone to $17,275 for that community. But that's not all. So here's how it's calculated. Ed spending per pupil divided by the base amount gives you a district spending adjustment. You multiply that times the statewide rate, which is 99 cents this year, and you come up with the local tax rate, and, and currently at 7.5%. In this particular community, what's that look like on a $200,000 tax bill? Well, in 2014, the rate was $1.52.3 cents. Uh, $1 the CLA was 104.45%, which means that this house is actually overvalued. If it went on the market, and this was not uncommon during the years of the Great Recession, if it went on the market, it would actually only sell for 180000 even though the grand list value is 200000 So in order to calculate the tax rate for that community, we reduce the tax rate because the house is overvalued to $1.45.8, and that yields a taxes due of 2,916. But in 2015, this same community in the $200,000 house, in the meantime, the market has recovered. And now this house is worth more than the $200,000 on the grand list value. So the CLA, or the adjusted value, drops to 97% because this house is now really worth $215,000. So we take the 1.637 that we calculated on the last slide, a 7.5% increase, and we have to increase it in order to equalize the tax rate with other communities in the state. That boosts the tax rate to $1.67.8 or a 12.2% increase, a $358 increase in the taxes in, on that example house in that community. So that's how a 0.6% increase in education funding spending in a, in a given community can result in a 12.2% increase in your tax bill. So where do we go from here? Uh, I heard when I was knocking on doors in the last election that property taxes were reaching the breaking point. Citizens were having difficulty paying their property taxes, either selling off a piece of their property, downsizing to a smaller home, or even moving out of state. We need to deliver quality, equity, education to our students, but we need to do it in a way that taxpayers can afford it. So the speaker uh, st uh, formed a study committee of people across the political spectrum and asked them to sit down and look at this issue and what we might do. He also invited the public, either individuals or groups, to submit proposals to him. And between the two, over a, or nearly 100 proposals came forth to the, to the speaker. Most of them included some form of larger school district. Some even as large as one school district for the entire state, is, which is how Hawaii does their school system. Um, this is a chart of how our school system now works. <laughs> Would anyone in their right mind sit down and design a school system like this? But organically, this is how it's grown over the years. So this particular community has four elementary schools and a high school, middle high school. Not unlike Middlebury area, I think there are five, maybe six, elementary schools in the Middlebury area. Do you know, Mark, how many there are? Six. Uh, seven elementary schools. In my district up in Bristol, there are five. So this is, you know, you get beyond four, it gets way complicated. Um, and so each one has a school board. Each one has a set of parents, a set of students, a set of teachers, its own administration, uh, some school coaches, uh, and representatives to the union board, the union board's pretty sole responsibility is the central office hiring the superintendent, 
and uh, evaluating that superintendent. And the superintendent could be looked at as the CEO of this entire organization. I don't know about you, but I have no interest in being the CEO of an organization that looks like this. There are such incredibly cross lines of authority and responsibility. Each school board thinks that they have uh, control over the superintendent. The principals don't know whether they're responsible to their local school board or to the superintendent and the supervisory union board. Uh, it's hard to keep morale and, uh, whoops, it's hard to keep morale and, uh, and curriculum and coordination moving in the same path when you're operating within this kind of a system. I'm reminded of testimony that um, the curriculum director from a supervisory union that had four boards in it, um, and his uh, goal was to have a unified math curriculum, K through 12, in that school district. So he got the professionals together, the teachers and principals, and curriculum people, and they sat down, and in three months, they designed an integrated math curriculum, K through 12. It took him three years to get it through the various boards. Everyone wanted to put their fingerprints on it. Oh, my students need an extra week in fractions. And so he left that school district and went to a single unified school district and said he didn't have any interest in going back to a school district that looked like this. <clears throat> so we want to move the state towards sustainable educational governance models that provide equity, lead students to meet or exceed our new education quality standards, do it through uh, uh, maximizing our efficiencies, and delivering uh, it at a cost that taxpayers can afford. So we embraced the concept of larger school districts. But we left as much local control in that process, rather than specifying that it had to be turning a supervisory union into a school district, or a county into a school district, or even the state into a single school district, or one of the proposals was to have each tech center be a school district. Instead of specifying that at the state level, what we did was we said, we expect local communities, local school boards, local residents to come together to figure out what's best for their region. Uh, and uh, we proposed some preferred models. Uh, the preferred model was, uh, and I'm not sure I have a slide on that, the preferred model was either operate schools uh, pre-K through 12 in a single district, which would be feasible for the Middlebury District to be a single school district that operated moms and the high school and all the elementary schools in the, that now feed moms and the high school. They're part of the supervisory union. Or to have uh, a group of schools that um, operate, that, that uh, operate maybe K through six schools and tuition students beyond the sixth grade, or K through eight, operate K through eight schools, and then tuition students beyond grade eight, or tuition all students in, uh, within the district. So those are the four preferred models that we put in our statute. Um, we also included some tax incentives. Um, let me go back. We, we uh, included some tax incentives. Um, so if you're an accelerated merger, which this community could be, getting, you have to uh, vote to, to uh, form this larger uh, unified school district by uh, July, by next July, and it has to be operational by July of 17. There's t a 10 cent reduction in the uh, property tax the first year, eight cents the second, six, four, two. So it, it uh, creates a transition into what should be uh, greater efficiencies and, um, and operations. We phase out phantom students. So many years ago, uh, a provision was put in law, say you had a school of 100 students and you lost 10 students. So it would be pretty difficult in a single 
school budget to absorb the, the loss of, of 10 students uh, and not have your tax rate soar. So we put protections. We, the legislature, I wasn't there at the time, the legislature put a protection in that you could lose no more than 3.5% of your population. And so the 100 students, that the, the school that lost 10 of its 100 students, in order to calculate property taxes for that community, instead of dividing by 90, we'd be divide by 96.5. Um, and that helped reduce the property tax rate uh, in those communities. So the way that that bill was written and implemented uh, and combined with the regular decline we've had in student population over the last decade and a half, um, the, we have one school in the state with 100 students, 44 of whom are empty seats. So that means your taxes and mine are paying to educate students in empty seats. And what that really means is that the taxes are reduced in that community significantly, nearly in half of what they would be if they were actually paying for the education of the students that were in that building. So we phased those out, effective uh, fiscal year 21, uh, except for the enlarged school districts. So if you form a, a greater union, uh, of a larger school district, then that protection remains uh, of a uh, loss of th no more than 3.5% of your student body in a given year. Um, whoops, what happened here? Um, we also converted small schools grants, so a number of the communities throughout the state get a grant because they have fewer than 100 students in their building or fewer than 20 students at any grade level. And we phased those out in, in a way. What we did was, if you form a greater union, you get to keep that as a merger grant forever. Um, it's, it's not a particularly large amount of money out of our $1.3 billion education fund. Um, and we wanted to have an incentive in place for small schools to join in with larger schools and, and come together in a school district. So that merger grant continues unless you close the school, school building or unless the merger requires uh, uh, additional construction on a building and then you get to keep the uh, merger grant for the duration of the bond. And beginning in FY20, it's only if you have a grades of fewer than 20, the fewer than 100 students in the building goes away because we have buildings with K through 6, K through 8, K through 12, you know, the, so we specified just fewer than 20 students in a grade level. And it must be geographically isolated from a school or demonstrate uh, excellence in our new education quality standards. We um, we put we heard the me we got the message that um, property taxes needed to come under control, so we put uh, temporary two-year cost control measures in place while these larger school districts were being formed, and what we did was we have had a high spending threshold in place for a number of years. And the way it worked was 123% of the previous year's average only captured a very few, a handful of schools throughout the state. We said we need to put downward pressure on property taxes in every school district in the state. So the high spending threshold that was created envisioned an overall increase in the education fund spending of 2%, vary, varying from uh, the school that uh, spends currently $20,000 per pupil would get 0% increase in their per pupil costs to school spending at the $10,000 level would get over 5% uh, increase in their per pupil costs and stay under the high spending threshold. What is the high spending threshold? Any dollar amount you spend over that per pupil cost, you count twice when you're calculating taxes. So in a sense, the citizens of the community are double taxed on the overage.
Okay, but why merge district? What is a value in an expanded school district? So here we have three mythical Vermont towns all standing alone in their little silos. And in the green town, an educator retires and they lost three students. So now what does the school board do? Do they cut the teacher position and not rehire and maybe ha subsequently have to reduce educational opportunities for the students in that school? Or do you keep that teacher and having your, have your per pupil costs go up? Difficult choices. Less educational opportunity, which school boards are loath to do. And these are, this is not just one town in Vermont. This is happening across the, across the state. We're losing students across the state. So we have three schools in this mythical supervisory union that are each struggling, each of their school boards are struggling with this alone, on their own. If we expanded the governance and had one school board for all three schools, now we can move educators around, we can move students around. And in fact, this has happened in Chittenden East. Uh, the governor chose Bolton as a community to sign the education bill in because of the exciting thing that happened. Bolton was on the verge of closing. Its uh, per pupil cost was going through the roof and taxes were going through the roof. Uh, and the student population was dropping and they saw nothing in their future except closing their school. Uh, and because of the formation of the Chittenden East Supervisory Union, that school today is alive and thriving. Well, how did that happen? They had a class in the, um, in the Bolton School with six students in it that required a teacher. And they had a class in, in uh, I believe it's a kindergarten class in, in Jericho that had 24 students, required two teachers. So they had three teachers for 30 students. They asked families that lived actually closer to the Bolton School, lived in Jericho but actually lived closer to the Bolton School, if they would like to have their students be educated at the Smiley School in Bolton. So uh, a bunch of parents said, great, that's fine with them. So they were able to put 15 students in the Bolton class and 15 in the Jericho class and have it one teacher in each school. So saved a teacher position. That's the kind of thing that can happen. Keep educational quality. We know that 15 is about the best class size, that there's a lot of interaction between students that actually help students grow and learn. Uh, and so keeping class sizes around 15 uh, to 17 is an optimal situation and they were able to do that because they came together under a single school board. Scalable and sustainable. And I like this, limitless, limitless possibilities to organize the delivery of world-class education at a cost we can afford. There's a great deal of flexibility on how these districts are formed. I had a phone call this morning, first thing this morning, you know, what are you doing to us? You're, you're, you're a bunch of communists, you just want everything to be controlled out of Montpelier. Uh, our, school district, our school building is, is uh, owned by the municipality where there's a covenant on the deed that if it's not used as for education that it has to be returned. I said, well, it's, you know, it's, it's easy. You, you continue ownership of the building and you lease it to the school district. I mean, there are, there are many, many ways to deal with the obstacles. If you have a goal in mind of where you want to get to, the obstacles become something you can deal with. If you're determined to let the obstacles stop you, then you're never going to get anywhere. Mer these merger agreements are developed locally. And there can be a great deal of variation in what the relationship is of the local school board, for example. In my communities, uh, there's a great deal of concern about what's going to happen to the local school board. That school board can continue to exist. 
Uh, they could even continue to develop a budget that they submit to the Central School Board for approval. Um, they, but I think it would be, if I were designing it, I would think that it would be great to have a local school board that did all the extras, the field trips, the mentoring programs, uh, and uh, maybe an art program or something that within the confines of the budget uh, are not possible, but we want for our children. And volunteer school boards could deliver these kinds of extras to schools. Here's an example that would fit this uh, region perfectly. You have Right now you have a supervisory union. By the way, nobody votes on the supervisory union budget. It gets assigned to local school districts and they have to deal with it. And if, if it's too much of an increase at the supervisory union level, the only choice that a local school board has is to cut the local school, the elementary school. So if it were a single supervisory union, a supervisory district, we would all vote on that budget. And the supervisory union budget would be subject to the scrutiny of the public and uh, changes might happen at the supervisory union level budget due to public uh, input. Here's another option that is going to fit other parts of the state. We have a number of communities that I indicated on the map earlier that offer varying kinds of choice. So uh, law prevents, uh, currently prevents uh, communities from operating schools and offering tuition payments. Uh, and I think that that's probably a good idea. We're, we're being encouraged by some to open that up. But what we've seen in Concord, Vermont, is they have closed their public school because they could no longer sustain it and offer tuition to uh, students in their community. So they chose to close the school. And I, th I think that that is the result. Private schools and public schools play by very different rules. Um, public schools have much higher requirements on what they, what they need to adhere to. Um, and to use a basketball analogy, um, if we're forming teams and I get to choose all the top tier students and you get to check, choose the second tier basketball players, I'm going to win every time. And that's the way it is if you try to operate a school and offer uh, vouchers for um, students to go to attend other schools. Uh, you might just as well determine that you're going to close your public school in the first place and not go through the process of a slow death. So this permits that. You can have one district that is the choice schools and one district that's the operating schools, keeping the supervisory union model. It's not as efficient as a previous idea of, of one school district, but it's better than what we have now. Here's a timeline. So the top is the accelerated merger. So by 2016, that's next July, it has to be approved by the electorate, and it has to be an operational a year later. For conventional mergers, which are essentially the same, there's a few different rules. Um, they're in place now, and Middlebury has talked about going through a conventional merger. Um, the tax incentives drop a little bit. They, don't start, they start at 8 cents instead of 10 cents. Um, and uh, the rules, it, it has to be four districts uh, or 1,200 students. So the accelerated mergers is 900 students. Um, the, the advantage is that there are some areas of the state where four districts don't even get to the 900 level. So it, there are reasons and places in the state where the conventional merger makes more sense than the accelerated merger. And that has to be voted on by July of 17 and then operational by July of 19. Some alternate structures. So if you don't like this and your community study committee gets together, you can propose an alternate structure. And you can present that structure to the Secretary of Education. And in, the, in all of these mergers, the State Board of Education has the final say. Um, if you do nothing, none of these three, then the agency is authorized to go into your region and design a school, larger school district for that region. 
and submit that proposal to the State Board of Education for approval. And they are also going to be operational in 2019. Um, and then ongoing, the State Agency of Education has already started. It's being piloted in 19 uh, school districts, supervisory unions right now. The uh, state plans to visit every school in the state on a three-year rotating basis and do educational quality reviews to make sure that those schools are delivering quality education to our students. So this is what I, I uh, so I should give credit where credit's due. Representative Oliver Olson from Londonderry developed many of these slides. Uh, I modified some of them. Um, this slide is from the Agency of Education. There are several others that are from the agency. Um, I did very little of my own creation. I borrowed and, and amended slides that I found. And I like this one because it shows what quantum leaps or what thinking in a different way about accomplishing the same task can bring to a problem. And this is Olympic high jump, not a, not a, not a school district. But years ago, in the early 1900s, it was a scissors jump that got us over the high jump bar. But that didn't even reach two meters. So in around 1920, someone invented the Western Roll. And that, by gum, that got us over two meters, a new way of jumping over the bar. Then the straddle was invented in the 50s and uh, brought another quantum leap in uh, an ability to get over a high jump. And now the Fosberg flop, Fosbury flop, we're way up at 2.4 meters to win the Olympics. So it's not that we're building better athletes necessarily, we're inventing better ways for those athletes to perform. And that's what we're talking about with students in our state. We need to invent better ways for our students to succeed. So moving ahead, what limitations prevent us from making our system better? How can we change, break, or bend those limits? And what, how we've always done it, assumptions, might be keeping us from finding ways to create better opportunities for students? So I'd like to open it up to questions and discussion. I'm sure that there's a lot of concern. Yes? Um, Can you repeat the question? So yes, the question is why not move to an income uh, system for uh, paying for schools? And there are, there are several reasons. Um, there's a political reason. So three governors from two parties have said absolutely no. Uh, secondly, uh, it's pretty easy to hide income. It's really tough to hide a big beautiful house. And so there is some Additional, the third reason is that there is a stability and a consistency about property taxes that is not there with regard to income taxes, which can be volatile. Uh, even in the last recession, we saw that even though property values did decrease in the last recession, they decreased nowhere near as dramatically as income taxes did. So, uh, and then lastly, I would say uh, there have been uh, three uh, tripartisan efforts in the legislature to bring forward, there's one on the wall in my committee right now to move to an income base. The one on my committee wall has no numbers on it because when uh, legislative efforts to put numbers on it really have resulted in dramatic increases in property taxes for, well, I don't know, dramatic as a, as a the loaded word, have meant increases in property taxes for payers of households between 47, well, between zero and $100,000. They would pay more. 
a decrease in property taxes between 100,000 and 250,000 of, of uh, income. They are the income category that pay the most right now in property taxes as a percent of income. And then a huge increase in uh, property taxes for those with uh, wealth over a half a million dollars. And so um, I, when a proposal came to me and I started looking at the numbers when I was on the Ways and Means Committee and went to Speaker Symington at the time, and I said, you realize this proposal will have renters and trailer home owners pay dramatically more in property tax, in education taxes than they do now. Is that the direction we want to go in? And the speaker said, no. So there are many forces from many different directions that prevent us from moving to a, an income-based system. Yes? So um, the phantom student money applies, the loss of phantom students applies whether you're geographically isolated or not. It does not have to do with geographic isolation. At 2021. It goes away for everybody whether you're geographically isolated or not. The geographically isolated concept applies to keeping a small schools grant. Okay, two different things. So the, so the small schools grant goes away if you're not geographically isolated. And there is a definition that the Agency of Education came up with a number of years ago, and it includes a bunch of schools. And we had some testimony that said, well, there's really only one school in the state that's actually really geographically isolated. Um, we didn't really have the time or the capability of determining which was right, or is there a number in between? So what we did was charge the State Board of Education on an annual basis to determine what schools are geographically isolated. Yes, sir. Well, as a part of the agreements, the, the, the articles, of, of, uh, uh, articles of Agreement is what they're called. As a part of those Articles of Agreement, you have to come to some uh, agreement with the, the bargaining units. Uh, and there is transition language in the bill uh, to how to transition through that to get to a single contract for, for all teachers in that district, in that new greater union. Yes? It could mean that, but I doubt it. I think, you know, one of the, there's been many suggestions to have a statewide teacher's contract, and my suggestion is that that would dramatically increase the cost of, of uh, education in the state, because we would have a tendency in the state to level up, um, and I think that that would be the tendency in these. Uh, but those are up to local agreements. Um, they're, they're not in Act 46, and the state has no intention of intervening in, in that discussion. It's up to the local communities how they come together, and they, it, it could possibly mean the reduction in salaries for some teachers. I think it's important to point out that, on average, the teachers in Vermont are paid less than any state in the Northeast, with the exception of Maine, and that they're paid less than the national average. So it's not what an individual teacher is getting paid, it's the number of paid adults that we have in the building that is driving our educational costs. Yes?
wondering if part of this, what kind of really good contemporary measure of student outcomes would be part of this to know that kids in Vermont are educated? So there's active work going on in the Agency of Education as a part of these quality review standards. Uh, we don't, I don't, and I think a majority of us don't believe that test scores alone are a measure of, of quality. Um, and uh, we need to have a broader understanding of what quality means. Um, and um, the secretary has a, a slide from which I, I borrowed a couple of slides that talk about how in, in uh, two high schools in Vermont, one offers a list of maybe 10 different science options for students as they go through their high school career, and another high school has only three. And so course offerings are part of, of the situation that has to be understood. There, I had a conversation with the president of the university um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, maybe a month ago, uh, and the University of Vermont has this wonderful program uh, where the valedictorian of every school in the state can go tuition free to UVM. Fantastic program. And there was a valedictorian that didn't apply. And he wondered why. With such a fantastic program in a pretty good school, why the student wouldn't even apply to the university. And when he investigated it, he, he found out that the school did not offer the courses required for that student to be a candidate to, be, to enter UVM. That's how poor the educational opportunities are in some of our high schools. We have four high schools in one region of the state. The combined graduation of the four high schools is 61 students. And so I think education is pretty robust in this area but it's not so robust in some other areas, areas of the state. And we have a responsibility to think about educating all the students in the state. Other questions? Yes? Dave, can I give a brief update on what, where the ACSU is in this process and it's an invitation? Uh, you know, I can't. Um, well, I think no, that... May I? Oh, yes, please. <laughs> Thank you. Because I can't. Here, take the microphone. All right. I'm uh, Rick Scott. I'm chair of the ACSU board, which is the Middlebury uh, School District or uh, School Supervisory Union. We are well along the path of pursuing the accelerated merger currently. There's uh, five other board or four, five total board members here today, three of which are on the what we're calling the charter committee, which is uh, by statute the study committee. And on the 19th of next week, that that body will be voting on the articles of agreement which have been drafted and are out for review to districts currently. So we're headed there and we're looking at a town meeting vote uh, on this, uh, on, on, that for, on taking action along the accelerated merger and bringing our boards together. On the 23rd of this month at the high school, it, we're going to have a public forum, community-wide forum, which obviously you're all invited to, and we'll have a panel discussion on this. We'll dig into some of the specific questions, some of which, which were asked today about uh, the, the contract, the master agreement, and so forth, and what this looks like, and take questions and try and uh, clarify the uh, aspects of this as it specifically applies to ACSU. So I would encourage you all to attend November 23rd, 7 p.m. in the high school auditorium. When the red process was happening, the earlier idea of merging, what of small town people were hearing is, oh, everybody needs to come to Middlebury. Uh, there's more opportunity there. And so already there was this bias of close to small schools, some of which are doing very well and maybe doing better than Middlebury, but there's an attitude of, because we're big, we have more opportunity. And yet, I think about, Preschool programs we now have in place for kindergartners, 
half an hour at least around their town on a school bus, another half an hour into Middlebury. And they're a very young child, an hour on the bus. That's just not acceptable to me. Um, certain schools are better with taking care of those pre-lunch kids that need a lot of extra encouragement. Um, some kids will be lost in the crowd if we put them into all those schools. So I've been talking with some other educators in my town, and what people are saying is, yes, it's nice if you're voting on money, we think you probably by law have to have it per capita, the population size. But as far as the quality of the schooling and the actual educational policy decisions, that each town should have a representative rather than this big clump in Middlebury determining all the other small <coughs> There will be school by school representation in what they can offer to the new measure. Is so that possible? I'll let you answer for ACSU in a minute, but what I will say is one of the really exciting thing, a couple of really exciting things that have happened is that first of all, the agency and those of us in the legislature expected maybe only five or six districts to uh, take part in the accelerated merger. It looks right now like there'll be 11 uh, districts participating in the accelerated merger. Um, secondly, um, uh, I would say about a really exciting news yesterday about Chittenden East Supervisor Union. So this was a big concern in the town of Huntington. They're a, they're a relatively small town. They're the furthest away from the Union High School in Chittenden East. And um, they uh, did not want to participate in the, uh, um, does this work or what am I doing wrong? They, they did not want to participate in the uh, uh, formation of the larger school district in Chittenden East. So they opted out. And we have a process where um, uh, as long as a majority of the schools in the supervisory union join, for, vote to join the, the uh, district, it cannot be part of the accelerated district, but it can be part of the, the uh, conventional merger. And uh, so they went forward, and uh, Huntington saw what happened in Bolton, that Bolton was actually much better off, the small school that uh, was actually much better off than, than uh, they were before the merger, standing on their own. And now they are having a vote on town meeting day whether to join Chittenden East because there's a recognition that actually their small school is, will be better off under the auspices of this larger, even though they don't have the absolute votes on the board. So I will, uh, I'll do my best to address the, uh, the number of concerns that you raised uh, specifically for ACSU. So the way the Articles are being are drafted currently, and again, this has not uh, been passed. Passed as of yet. Does that work? If you could, please. Hold oh, you've it got it. You've got it here. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, is that there will be 15 representatives in total? Eight of those are from Middlebury, one from each of the rural districts, and one at-large member that is voted on by the rural districts only. So an eight-seven split. If you're looking at that town differentiation. I would, uh, and there's another clause that's written in there regarding school closures, and that's that it requires uh, 10 members of the full board or a supermajority to pass that, so it, it gets beyond that uh, town border concern. Your concern is not uh, unique at all. We hear it. We've been uh, engaging all of the school boards and, and other uh, stakeholders in this conversation for the last four weeks now, and we continue to do that. And that conversation comes up a lot, and not just in the small towns, Middlebury as well. There, that concern was voiced by people in, in, in their community, not you know, for the rural schools, for the advantage of the rural schools. In the legislation uh, is a statement that says this is not intended to close small schools, and we agree with that locally. On the contrary, the small school grant specifically is $455,000 for ACSU, so that's a teacher in every rural school. That's significant. And if we don't pursue this and it all fell to pieces and we tried to go it alone, we'd be having a conversation about school closures much more quickly than we would have under consolidation. So that's our perspective on it. I think there was more to that question, but that's all I could remember. So. I think that, 
I don't want to speak for a new board. It's that we're leaving the articles written in such a way that the new board is responsible for future decisions, obviously. Uh, the general sentiment, though, of existing board members and people involved in this conversation is that we're not looking to equalize by bringing down the highest performing schools to the lowest level, but to bring the lower levels up to, to accomplish equity by, by raising standards across the board to the best practices that are happening throughout the SU now. And other board members, charter committee members, if you want to chime in on this or add to that, let me know. Thanks. So I would just like to add that I happen to have a very good friend who is a librarian in this supervisory union. And uh, moving from one school to another, being a point three here and a point one there, and it, it's difficult for the human service uh, department. It's also difficult for the librarian herself to figure out uh, who was getting, who was paying her, when she was getting paid, what her job was going to be in the next year. Uh, and I think in many instances th there'll be an ability to move to a full-time position for the supervisory union and then have that professional move from school to school as needed in the, in the smaller rural schools, whether that's a French teacher or a librarian or a nurse or whatever art teacher that might be a shared resource. Instead of trying to hire a, a point two or a point three individual, you hire a full-time individual. You get a, a, a better quality pool of, of applicants to choose from, and um, you're able to deliver services to children in a more efficient way. So I, I think that the, it offers a lot of flexibility that, um, that will deliver better quality to students. Other questions? Yeah. So we had testimony from the School Business Persons Association, VASBO, that estimated $30 million in savings in business practices. And an example of that, he said in his, in his supervisory union, um, all the school districts purchase fuel collectively, so they have a, an agreement with a fuel oil company, and presumably they get a good price doing that. And nevertheless, uh, when the billing comes, he has to pull money from each school district budget, put it into the supervisory union, issue, issue a check out of the supervisory union, post the spending uh, back to the books for each of the school districts, each of which needs to be audited annually. Uh, and uh, uh, there is savings there. He said that pretty quickly he could reduce his staff in his, in his office by three individuals just in terms of paperwork shuffling, never mind the opportunities for fraud and, and embezzlement that are available if you're moving money around like that for every collective purchase that you make. So there are administrative and business savings to be made. There are savings like the example I showed where by moving some students from point A to point B, you, you can utilize teachers in a more efe efficient way. Um, so our, our uh, joint fiscal office estimated somewhere between 25 and $50 million in savings in both business practices and educational practices. So it's hard to say uh, what will actually come to fruition. The Chittenden uh, Central Supervisory Union that just voted to merge uh, expects to have a million dollars annual savings. So, uh, you know, in a, in a $50 million budget, I think is their budget, it's not a whole lot of money. Uh, but I'll tell you what, a million bucks is a million bucks. So if we can save that in, uh, in th they're combining two supervisory unions, the, Chittenden East is a single supervisory union, and they are saving nearly a half a million. So we have 60 supervisory unions. If we can save a half million each in each one of them, that's $30 million. That's real money. So, um, and, and if we can do that and increase educational opportunities for students, then that's a win-win.
that I hesitate to, to offer an answer in hypotheticals because what changes is up to the new board. I would add to that a couple of, of thoughts. Uh, one is op it's operational efficiency. It really goes more towards uh, improvements, of, uh, academic improvements and what's best for the students. Right now, we estimate the superintendent and the senior administration in the central office spends 40% of their time on board management. There's 50 board members right now. There's meetings on a nonstop basis, and there's a lot of work that goes into that. We, as a board, feel that time will be much better spent in academics and in, in, in pursuing the strategic plan and uh, accelerating that process and improving educational outcomes. Uh, the uh, other aspect of it is, um, I've lost my train of thought, I'm sorry. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> other questions? Yes. Yes. Which is true in many ways. But <laughs> well, those, those are, I've taught both um, uh, alone, a, a single teacher in a classroom, and then also as a part of a team teaching uh, crew, if you will. And uh, uh, both were satisfying for me, um, but I think that you can, you do have more flexibility and ability to uh, address student issues if you're working in collaboration with other educators. I'm going to go back here. I'll come back to you. Uh, yeah. Just to get back to Santa Cruz, because I, I need to understand this from a program district that $2 million is in fact in the fund. Um, it will all stop in, in 2021, regardless of merger, or, or we will, if we merge, uh, accelerate a merger or, or potential, <coughs> will it continue past that, or will it all stop in 2021? So nobody receives phantom funds. So I'm not quite sure what you're talking about. Our equalized people count compared to our actual equalized people count to receive these funds as uh, and say so reduced your tax liability by a million bucks. Um, it goes away for everybody except merged districts. Okay, so if you're if you create in ACSU, you create this merger, and if the entire school district loses more than three and a half percent of their students, they're protected for a year. It's, it's pretty, it's, it's a lot more difficult for a school district that has one or two thousand students to lose more than three and a half percent of their students, sure. but, but the protection does remain for those larger school districts. No, no, it goes away 2021, bang. Other questions? Yes, sir. I don't know quite how to phrase this, but um, the, you, you pointed out that people you've talked to have said their property taxes are too high, and that's a real concern. Has there been a concern about the impact on the general fund and other services that the state provides as well uh, with funding going towards education? I've not heard people blame education for uh, the budget problems we're having. We're facing another roughly $70 million gap. Virtually all of it is healthcare related. So if there's a, f and, and that also applies to 
the, the uh, serious concerns that have been raised by our new high spending threshold, that the increases in uh, health care premium costs to school districts is going to eat up nearly half of the, uh, of the allowable spending growth. Um, and we're actually having a uh, education committee meeting on the 18th, next Wednesday, uh, to hear concerns about the new high spending threshold. And we may take some action to uh, relieve some of the pressure on school districts. It's really health care costs that are eating us alive in this state. Um, and I, I was extraordinarily disappointed that we couldn't move forward on universal health care in the state. I understand. Uh, why it happened uh, the way it did, and uh, the, I think it took the steam out of the governor's agenda to, um, to have to give up universal health care, but it's certainly uh, the current um, situation we have with paying for health care costs are just, uh, you know, just eating us alive in our budget, both, both in school budgets and in uh, our state budget. Yes, sir. Students identified with disabilities does not seem to be declining. Is that a more general trend in the state as a whole? And if so, what is the state doing to help <coughs> supervise the unions think through how to more effectively uh, educate children with disabilities? So that's a really good question and is very high on my priority list. Uh, I have made it clear to the Agency of Education that I expect to, that we expect in the Education Committee to deal with some issues around special education. Um, so I think that there are a number of things happening in special education. We have opiate abuse um, and uh, there's some just, I don't remember the facts off the top of my head, but there's an extraordinary number of young children under the age of five that are either in state custody or uh, are being uh, dealt with in a way that's connected to opiate abuse and, and special needs. And that influx of students, those students are going to be coming into our schools in the next several years. And so this is a, a really big problem we have to deal with. Um, another issue is that we run special education on a reimbursement basis. So um, if I uh, am pay, and we pay 60% of the cost up to uh, $50,000 expense per pupil per year. Uh, above that we pay, we the state pays 90% of the cost of educating a special needs child. So if I sent you to the grocery store and said that I was going to pay 60% of the cost of your buying groceries, your ha buying habits might be different than if you're paying for it all on your own. So I think that there are some incentives there to spend money that um, are not helpful. Secondly, uh, thirdly, um, I have heard from special educators, especially at the elementary school level, if you assign an individual aid to a child early on in their, in their education career, you might just as well paint a red R on their forehead and it stigmatizes the child in a way that is not helpful. And in fact, the evidence shows that in most cases, the assignment of an individual aid does not enhance the educational outcomes for students as they go through their educational career. There are two really exciting things that are happening in our state. One is that there, has, there was a consultant that was, um, offers uh, services to any school district that wishes to apply. Um, uh, their, their charge is 50000 They made a special deal with two uh, supervisory unions in Vermont to uh, provide services because they were so small to both of them for the $50,000 and they identified $1.6 million in savings for those two uh, institutions. Uh, and we have five pilot projects called the SWIFT program where they operate under different rules where um, documentation is right now we require every 15 minutes of a, of a child's uh, services delivered to be documented. So um, in my view, you know, like every 15 minutes of a special educator's time, five of it is spent filling out the paperwork for the state. 
not a very effective use of a professional's time. Um, and so what the SWIFT program has done is it ha has moved away from individual aides to classroom aides in a heterogeneous classroom um, working on project-based education. And these are in young elementary school students and they've found dramatic increases in effectiveness of special education. So I'm interested in growing the SWIFT program. I'm interested in bringing this consultant to more school districts in the state and I'm interested in changing how we fund special education in a way that allows A, more flexibility, but B, more accountability for um, school districts in using special education funding. It's a big problem uh, and uh, it's only going to get bigger in the, in the coming decades, so uh, it's important that we get uh, a handle on some of these problems. How would a citizen be interested in these kinds of issues get involved in this kind of project? Um, specifically special education? Yes. So I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I guess I would start by calling the Agency of Education and saying that you're interested in uh, getting involved in special education in the state. How can I do that? Another way might be to go to your local school board and say, you know, what are we doing? Are we, uh, are we going to apply for the SWIFT program? What, do you, what are you doing for special education? How can I get involved? Those are two things that are suggestions I can come up with. Other questions, comments? Absolutely, and we're putting money and effort at, pre at the preschool level, um, and pardon? Not enough. Not enough, well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's never enough. Um, so both of our boys went to the Starksboro Cooperative Preschool, and I think it gave them a, a head start. Another thing that I've learned this summer in a, in a seminar that I went to is that the data is striking about math, and I, I like math, so, um, so that's okay with me, but the, the, I have always thought that uh, reading, by grade, reading with your grade level by grade three was incredibly important for the success of a child. It turns out that like being at a math level with regard to your cohort when you reach third grade is considerably more important in determining the success of that child, which surprised me because I always thought of, of uh, literacy. Um, but we tend to teach math uh, not enough in the early years. And then secondly, we tend to teach it sort of in isolation as this sort of theoretical thing, two plus two, you know, what is two and, and what is another two, instead of what we do with reading a lot, and I see it with my wife and our grandchildren, is we teach reading in context. It's in a story. Um, and so I think we need to change some methodology of how we teach math, particularly in early years, and um, make sure that our students are with grade level by, by grade three. We find, we're, we fall behind in two areas in the state that need particular work, and that is educating students from low income families and inspiring students to go for education beyond high school. And the biggest hurdle for education beyond high school is math. It's the biggest hurdle for getting into college. And then the first thing you do when you go to college usually is take Algebra two, And it's a reason why it, uh, a, a bunch of students don't continue education beyond their freshman year. So we, we have real work we have to do with uh, math in our, uh, in our schools. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Dave, mine's not a question. the different courses of the day that we were including mathematics in what we were doing. But 
was impressive to me. Like I said, I'm not in the classroom now, maybe you're a more recent yeah, retired I, teacher, but it was, it was very, very good with young children, especially because when I took uh, math and ethics course in college, so long ago, um, we were at that point doing the new math of trying to associate algebra type realities with young students. But this British mathematics I thought was just outstanding. That's great to hear. Do you want to make more of a comment on that? Yes. bridges and around bridges and um, I recently, I, so I just retired in June um, from a school in Addison Central and I volunteer in um, Addison Northeast in one of their schools who have not, they use parts of bridges but they don't use, um, they they don't use it consistently and nowhere near to the extent of Addison Central. And you can really see the difference in, in what kids are able to do very early. I yeah. mean, very early, you mm -hmm. see how it has really it's taken two different paths. Yeah, there. and very early is where it's really important. Yeah. Other questions or comments? So, yeah. Um, in speaking to special ed, one of the observations that I saw, I was an itinerant teacher with migrant education, so I was in all 17 schools in the county. And so often I saw that the special educator was stuck in the office with the paperwork, and it was an aide, which at that point, had, they didn't have to have any years of college training, was delivering the services. And sometimes it wasn't even reality. What they were trying to teach was yeah. not what the child's so I really like the idea of more accountability, but using our special educators for their expertise, not just writing goals and objectives. Yep, absolutely. That SWIFT program sounds interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited by the results, yeah. So we're, we're wrapping up here. If there's one or two more questions, that'd be, that'd be great, but then um, we'll probably call it a morning. Yeah. I think we're fine. Thank you very okay. much, Dave, for coming to you. You're welcome.